I'll start with the, you know, obvious slide. This is the motivation behind Pernix data. This is motherhood and apple pie at this point, is everyone knows that storage is one of the last unsolved problems in virtualization today, at least at the infrastructure layer. And everyone knows that Flash is some form of a solution. But the real question is, you know, how would you leverage Flash? Everyone knows what Flash can do. You know, the nine million IOPS or 10 million IOPS or whatever that number is. But, you know, how do you leverage Flash in a way that is extremely efficient, um, both from a operational point of view and from a, um, from a capital point of view? That is a real question. Now, we looked around, and at least when we got started, there were four obvious ways to use Flash. You can put it in the storage system. Uh, you, can, you can have your existing storage system, and you can put in some Flash components in it, i.e. upgrade the storage system. Uh, you could buy a new storage system, which has a bunch of Flash in it, and possibly also a new architecture around that Flash and how it lays out data and does data services and so on. You can buy some Flash devices in the network that front ends your primary storage system, and so it's between the primary storage system and the servers. It's a good way to maybe um, <clears throat> maybe um, shoehorn Flash into existing infrastructure. And the last thing is you can put uh, use server Flash. We looked at all these, and you know, for the express purpose of solving the performance and scale problem with storage, we are not big fans of using Flash in the sand, uh, be it in the storage system or be it, be it in the network. Now, don't get me wrong. I think. Storage systems ought to evolve to use Flash. Some of them will evolve to be hybrid. Some of them will evolve to all Flash systems. And we have nothing against it. That's, that's very logical. But that's a good way to actually provide better capacity, better data services. You know, maybe metadata transactions would be faster on storage system, which means snapshotting would be much more feasible than it was earlier, or replication would run much faster, and so on. But for the express purpose of solving the virtual machine performance and scale problem to get you more performance for applications. We are not big fans of that approach. And the reason we aren't is the storage system flash or sand flash is just too far from applications. And so now we are in this ironic situation is that you have an extremely low latency device in front of a reasonably high latency network. You know, if we think about 10 gigi networks, you know, flash today does l less than 100 microseconds I.O. And it would just take you more than you know, 200, 400, 800 microseconds just to cross the network and all the queues that are in the middle to get to that Flash device. So it's an interesting use of Flash, but not the most efficient use of Flash is what I would like to tell you. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it's priced at capacity. Every time you try to shoe on some flash in the storage area network, you're really trying to either rip and replace your existing system, which is not an easy deal, because every time you do that, you got to rethink how you're going to do data services. And that's very ironic, too, because you started out solving a performance problem, but then that required you to change all your data protection workflows, all your DR workflows, and, you know, uh, you having to figure out a new operational model around a new system that you apparently are going to use. If you were to just upgrade your storage system, well, that's a six-month solution because it'll get you maybe 20% more capacity. I'm sorry, performance. But then six months later, as you add more servers, you're back to square one. And so all in all, uh, we think it's not the most efficient use of Flash for this exact performance problem that we have at hand. And so clearly, my bias is towards server flash. And so when we looked at server flash, um, it turned out that, well, that was interesting, but it wasn't practical. It wasn't practical because you, know, you could use server flash as a file system, for example. You can make a data store. You can throw in a bunch of virtual machines on it. But in doing so, you compromise all kinds of clustered operations that you have come to expect or come to use out of hypervisor-based systems today. You know, things like vMotion or DRS or HA. Or take your favorite pick. You also need to rethink your data protection in DR because that's the data services that the storage system was giving you. And now suddenly those, uh, those, those operations, I'm sorry, the services are gone. And so that's a problem using local data stores on flash devices. You could use flash devices as caches. And at least in our survey before starting Pernix data, all we could find 
was single host read-only caches. And it hasn't changed much since then, except for Pernix data, and that's my opinion. Uh, it's not, it's single host because it's not clustered. Every time a VM v motions, for example, it loses the flash footprint that it had just established on the local flash device. Now, you might have read about various flash solutions and uh, you know, one would say, well, that is compatible with vMotion, but that compatibility word is used very loosely. And what that means is, yes, the VM would move, but what is not very obvious to the end user is that the VM would lose all the flash footprint that it had just established. And so that's not a very practical solution because the ideal system would take care of the IOPS problem in the server tier and never have the storage tier have to ever face that problem. And when you, when, you, when you lose the flash footprint that you had established, then you would actually end up going to the storage tier every now and then as you do clustered operations. That's not very practical, uh, operationally at least. Um, the solutions weren't complete either. If you have a read-only cache, then well, you know, it only does so much. It doesn't accelerate databases, it doesn't accelerate analytics, it doesn't accelerate big data. And so at the end of it, you are still, uh, it, uh, you, you have a niche solution in your hand is maybe you can use it for VDI, but nothing else. And it's not interesting because you know the ideal solution on the server side would solve the uh, storage performance and scale problem at an infrastructure level in a way that works both for read and write and in a way that you can use any workload on. And that's our motivation. And so the opportunity we saw was to decouple the performance problem for capacity, like I just said, but to also do it in a way that is complete uh, and that is truly enterprise class that works with everything that the hypervisor offers you today. The uh, way we did it is we created this product called a Flash Virtualization Platform. What it does is it aggregates all server-side flash that you have in your data center across all servers that are running a hypervisor into one seamless flash cluster. And then you would use that flash cluster to accelerate virtual machines unmodified, running to a storage system that is absolutely unmodified. So the net effect of this layer created by Pernix data, this acceleration layer in the server, would be a faster data store. It could be a data store that you're already using, it could be a data store from a new storage system that you got in, it could be anything, it doesn't matter. The flash devices that we aggregate could be PCI devices, it, and they could be SSD devices, it could be a combination of two, it doesn't matter. This is all software. And so here's the nuts and bolts of it, or you know, a, a level uh, deeper, is the way we do it is we have extended the hypervisor. So we have created a kernel module that goes into for example, at this point, into uh, VMware ESX, into the VM kernel, for guys who are familiar with the ESX architecture. And so this is running in the hypervisor at privilege level zero. Uh, and it hijacks the virtual machine's IO path as it comes out of the virtual machine into the hypervisor, and before it goes out to its primary storage system. And then we figure out whether that IO ought to be served from a flash device or from the storage system. There's a few things here is one thing, it's all in the hypervisor. So this is as fast as one can get in terms of processing IOs on behalf of the virtual machine. It doesn't cross the network. It's not running inside a virtual appliance, uh, which, which is yet another can of worms. It is not running inside a VM, because if you're running hundreds of VMs or thousands or tens of thousands of VMs, that's a operationally non-sustainable problem. This is running in the hypervisor. So I'm sorry, what was that? I said you have a talent for understatement. <laughs> it's a, a FUBAR situation is what you would say, I guess. Something. Uh, something like that. We it's agree. It's a family podcast. Right. But hopefully that's clear. But any other questions before I go to the next slide? And so in my recollection, this is the first product to do it this way um, in a in a manner that is native to the hypervisor, in a manner that doesn't require any changes to the virtual machines or to the storage systems. If your storage system is doing some special command sets like VAI, well, it still does VAI. If it's an EMC LAN, it still looks like an EMC LAN. This is not a new data store that we expose for the VMs to use. 
or, or a new place for you to store data. It's just the same old data store that you're using, except it's magically faster. Now, these virtual machines tend to move around. So for example, you might have a vMotion operation going on or a DRS-based migration going on. In which case, a problem just happened is a virtual machine had established a, a reasonable amount of footprint. And you know, given the size of flash devices today, the, a particular, uh, uh, any single virtual machine might, might establish a flash footprint worth hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes. And so now, as the virtual machine moves to a new host, the question is, well, what happens to its flash footprint? Will the VM need to now go all the way out to the storage system to serve its IO? And so with Pernix data, the next thing we did is we, we clustered this platform. We are, let me rephrase. This, this platform is truly clustered. So as virtual machines move around, they can get access to their past storage footprint, their, their flash footprint, from any server in the cluster, regardless of where the flash footprint was. And so in this, this example, for example, when the VM resumes on the after a vMotion, when it resumes on the host on the right, FVP will transparently fetch uh, data blocks for that VM from the host on the left. And this, of course, is without the virtual machine's knowledge. There's no networking that the virtual machine has to understand or set up. Um, and then as we fetch data on behalf of the virtual machine into the new hypervisor, we also populate the new flash devices on the destination so that over time, what happens is you have transparently moved the VM's footprint from here to there. And, and so FVP's goal in life, the, the average case scenario that FVP tries to present to the VM is that its flash footprint should be as close to its current point of execution as possible. And this is, of course, absolutely non-disruptively you know, with respect to the VM. Any questions? All right, moving on. You know, when we started, we thought this technology was rocket science, but given you guys have no questions, looks like it's not. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I'm glad. If there are no questions, well, you know, then you you guys are understanding, which is great. That's connection between the servers that are in the cluster, of course, because it adds network latency if the VM is transferred to another physical host. Right. And, and the, the FEP data is not yet uh, transferred over. Right, so uh, that's a good, good point. Like, what's the network latency? Uh, if we are incurring network latency over it doing that, mm -hmm. why not maybe go to the SAN? And so it turns out, you know, first of all, you know, <clears throat> all these networks are really low latency and uh, you know, typically single op. If you are in blade systems, that it's even better than that. Mm -hmm. And so we are talking about typically 10 gig latencies out there versus multiple hops to the SAN. And not only that, but you got to actually take into account queuing delays on the storage system side, queuing delays on the initiator side, and so on. So overall, what we have seen, and you know, what typically happens is that you know, this cross-server traffic is much more lower latency and much more scalable because, you know, this is happening between, uh, you know, two nodes at a time, yeah. between many, many nodes, as opposed to happening between one node and a common entity. And so typically that latency is much lower than that latency. And it turns out if you are able to keep all that traffic in the server tier, then the storage system actually provides you lower latencies in the first place. In fact, it's a funny story. We had this customer and they were like, well, you know, maybe you should make a tool that predicts how much FVP will save us in terms of, you know, IOs and traffic and, you know, what would be the new latency versus the old latency. Well, it turns out that if you were to use FVP, then the data store latencies go down too. So it's very hard to make a tool because, you know, this, this is not a linear scale. This storage is not linear scale, right? It behaves very, very differently. Uh, with with different amounts of traffic, and so. so do you use a VM that, kernel port then to move that? Or? Yeah, so we use the vMotion network to move this da data. Yeah. And so, uh, when we go into the demo, that that's the other thing we are proud of is, you never configure anything in terms of networking, and uh, you know we are very proud of that because you know if you were to do that, then well, you know, so thirty-two you servers. The, you just look for the vMotion setting and then right. go and we use that network. Would it, would I be, so it's, it's a 
can you consider a software product or a hardware product? It is all software. So the only thing you get is the, the orange box. And you don't get it in a box, but you know, it, it's <laughs> it's just that it's all software. So you you bring the flash devices to the party, and you bring a storage system of your choice to the party. But at the moment, this is all VMware only. Uh, at, at the moment, yes. Um, so will John get a Hyper V version as well? Uh, <laughs> we do plan to Maybe do that. John, but only only John. <laughs> Custom for John. That, that's it. I shouldn't be saying that. Or maybe we can migrate him from Hyper-V to VMware and solve the problem. <laughs> oh, right. oh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So. Not unless Microsoft buys it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that ship has sailed. Uh, but no, I'm kidding. All jokes aside, though, uh, we do hope to do this for other hypervisors as well. Uh, you know, Given that we are a one-year-old company, we wanted to focus on what is very important which is to make a clustered solution, which is absolutely complete. And we wanted to do it on the most popular hypervisor today, but you know, obviously um, we want to. It's not hypervisor. Not yet, he said. He said not ever. Sacha, am I misremembering that there was an RDMA requirement? Oh, no, actually there is no RDMA requirement. In fact, the demos I'm going to show you is with networking configured out of the box. We haven't even cared to actually turn on jumbo frames on the switch. Uh, and we like to do that because you know the system should hold up to the you know the most average networks and then you know if you if you have RDMA or you know if you have hardcore configured 10 gig then it's just better it's icing on the cake but you need uh, very fast switches like we we do recommend that uh, for example in our lab we uh, we run a $2800 Dell Powerwall switch that we that I personally bought off of eBay and uh, it works just fine in fact, the demo is going to be off of that. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to take hardware sites. In fact, that's exactly the you know, great thing about being a software vendor. Uh, you know, people might people can go to the really high-end switches or you know, low-end ones. We don't care. Um, it's it's what you are comfortable with. So you have comfortable a list with. of you have a list of prerequisites uh, uh, Our prerequisites is that the uh, the networking hardware that you use on the server side ought to be on the ESX HCO. So, sorry? The networking hardware on the server side needs to be on the ESX hardware compatibility list. Ah, okay. so, That's all. So if you if if the networking vendor has a driver, then we are going to we are going to use it. Satya, we have a question from the uh, actually May show and, uh, from the Twitter from Israel. <laughs> wow. He says, how does a Phoenix data differentiate itself from VMware's upcoming D flash feature? Oh, I see. So, uh, you know, I can't talk much about, you know, a feature VMware hasn't released yet. But um, Maybe what that's I... one of the differentiators, right? <laughs> 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 uh, <you> know, zing! <laughs> that, yeah, zing, but that came from Chris, not from me. I love it. <laughs> you you know, can't I, say that because you're still in beta. <laughs> uh, well, that plus, you know, I love that company. I spent 10 years there, so... Uh, but anyway... Uh, you know, uh, to answer the question, the differentiator is that, and the next slide I'm going to show you. Uh, we don't believe that uh, there is a match for the clustering that Pernix data does, and for right back. We are going to talk about it, but uh, you know, after this slide, it'll be very clear. Thank you. And so, um, this is the third and you know last big thing that I want to show you. Um, we not only do read caching, but we do write acceleration as well. And the way we do that is, you know, we, I'm sorry, I should probably say, we offer two modes, write through and write back. And you can configure this on a per VM basis. So you can have some VMs in write through, some VMs in write back. When you have configured VMs in write back, the writes go into our layer and we forward them to the flash device and acknowledge the write to the virtual machine. So effectively what the application sees is flash class latencies. And in the background, we send out the writes to the storage system. Now this is big because, well, first of all, this, is, this now makes the solution complete. Uh, once you solve both the read and the write problem, the storage—I'm sorry—the server tier, 
now you have a really high chance of actually solving the storage performance as a server tier because you're not forwarding into the storage system. But <clears throat> more importantly, we've taken care of the other things that enterprise users would obviously need from a write acceleration system. And so there is a chance that the server goes down or the, or the, um, the flash device goes down uh, with, with a write that hasn't been destaged to the SAN yet. And so to protect you against that, you could configure every VM that runs in write back merge to have zero, one, or two uh, flash replicas. And so in that case, we would forward the VMs right to the local flash device and at least to zero, one, or two remote flash devices. And once they all acknowledge, we would acknowledge it to the VM. Now, the, the destaging goes on, like I just said, but if this host was to crash or if the networking was to go down or the link from this host to the SAN was to go down, one of the replicas would take over the job of destaging on behalf of that VM. Now, that VM might be powered on by DRS on any host in the cluster, including a host that is not one of the two replicas. And that is fine too. Pernix data will make sure that when that host is powered on on any, any part of your vCenter cluster, it will get the freshest copy, copy of data, regardless of which flash device it's in. You and regardless of, I'm sorry? You don't want to make use of the fact that it will be start up again on the host that mm -hmm. holds the... Uh, good point. So one can set uh, DRS affinity rules to make it such that you know you typically start on hosts that are your replicas. Yeah. And ideally, we would like to educate our users to do that in the long run. But for now, you, know, you can also run in the, I guess, Wild West merge, <laughs> where uh, you don't care where DRS restarts it. So those are the big things. Now, I will talk about the smaller things or you know, the, the finer details uh, as we go into the demos. But uh, you know, the two big things, two big points I wanted to make is this is the most seamless solution you'll ever find to solving your storage scale and performance problem. You don't need to change your storage system. You don't, don't need to upgrade your network. You don't need to add any more ports, et cetera. You don't need to change anything that runs inside the virtual machine. And yet, this works. And more importantly, this is the only enterprise class solution. And my definition of enterprise class solution in the server flash arena ought to be clustering and both read and write acceleration. And compatibility with every virtual machine op solution or operation that users are actually reliant on today things like DRS, HA, et cetera. And so the clustered nature of FPP makes it such that all that is compatible. The non-disruptive nature, the seamless nature of FPP makes it such that, you know, just right out of the gate, there is an extremely high chance that whatever SRM solution you're using, whatever data protection solution you're using on the storage system side, all that just continues to work because there is no change to the storage system. There's no new storage system to manage. Uh, we'll talk about numbers later, but you know, everybody talks about performance. So, uh, you know, I personally I love FAB because it is complete. It is enterprise class. But you know, here's my performance slide. Uh, because we are using server side flash, and because we are in a very low latency IO path right inside the hypervisor, we see latencies and we see IOPS that are not even comparable. And so, for example, out here. We ran a single VM on AESX host, and then we had two of those hosts, four of those hosts, six of those hosts. And at VM, the workload was 90% uh, reads, 50% random. It was designed to max out the IOPS that the storage system can provide. And we ran that workload against a 8 Gbps mid-range fiber channel system, SAN system, with a reasonable amount of NVRAM. We got 54,000 IOPS across two hosts. When we ran it across four hosts, the number actually went down because of maybe cross-host contention or NVRAM pollution or whatever it is. It 
went down to 49,000 IOPS. Six hours stayed at 49,000 IOPS. With FVP, with a SATA 2 device, uh, controller speed now starts to matter because, uh, you know, as we'll see later in the demos, our data structures are in the technology deep dive. Our data structures are designed to extract the last bit of performance out of a flash device. And so with a SATA 2 device on two hosts, we ran at around 75,000 IOPS. You know? Four hosts is 150,000 IOPS. Now these are numbers that actually disorient people. These are numbers that make people tweet about Pernix data the, the very night they use it for the first time. Um, but, but my point here is to not to tell you that these are the numbers you should aspire for. Because you know, tell me a workload which requires 350,000 IOPS, although we do. My point here is this is why I'm very confident that this is the right architecture. You, know, you can upgrade your storage system to get X percent more. Uh, you can throw in more flash in the network to get X percent more. But this is how you do true scale out. Every time you add CPU and memory for virtualization, you get more storage as well. Oh, good point. So features like uh, uh, compressing all the stuff that we are holding in our tier just to increase the effective capacity, uh, deduplicating again to increase the effective capacity. Yeah, they are all, uh, we, we, we don't do compression, compression today, uh, sometime in the future. Uh, we limit deduplication to VDI scenarios. Uh, we don't do it generally because we don't want to, you know, there's always a workload that goes wrong. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, right now the the system has enough value that um, you know deduplication is not a high priority. But yeah, over time uh, we'll look look at putting it in. And about the licensing, uh, you are uh, proposing the software on the CPU or host uh, on storage. Are you writing me a check? <laughs> 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 no, just uh, <laughs> we. Is it your office? Hey, he might see, be the CTO, it. but he's also seen the check. Hey, you know, yeah. Look, the CEO can't make it because of budget restraints, right? So, <laughs> uh, check would be highly appreciated. Anyway, <laughs> uh, actually, that's the other funny part. Uh, uh, beta user actually bought Pernix data while we are in beta, and you know that is the beauty of this technology. That that's what kind of you know makes me want to do this business over and over again. Anyway, to answer your question, we'll keep the licensing uh, very simple. Um, we, we will keep the licensing simple enough that channel partners can, can very easily sell it to people. There's no, you know, it's like, oh, well, tell me how much you're consuming, and so I'll make you a quote, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, excuse me, but you know, that's, that's my answer for you right now. Maybe privately we can talk okay. more. <laughs> Um, do you see, I am camera shy, I guess. Sorry, do you see the addition of uh, you know, encryption and EDU and all that kind of stuff, compression? I mean, don't you see that as actually bogging down the system? Uh, funny thing, uh, I do. And in fact, you know, the, the way flash capacities are growing, there is also, <coughs> it is also questionable as to how much uh, benefit that'll give you because you know maybe the user might just throw in a bigger flash device. And so yeah, I totally in fact again, you know, that's why we didn't suddenly jump on the board saying, okay, let's do dedupe and compression. We obviously did dedupe where it actually absolutely makes sense, which is VDI. But you know, for the regular case we are not fully convinced and we'll wait for data to figure out what to do and how much to do. You. So you know this is the tactical slide. You know, people see the immediate benefits. In fact, we joke about this constantly because a lot many times when I am talking about Pernix data or Pujan is talking about Pernix data, we don't even describe the problem we are solving. <laughs> and that's because it's so obvious. And, and if you were to actually have a server-side solution that is reasonably complete, then the choice is also very obvious. Is that, yeah, well, you know, this is going to be much uh, more cost effective than solving the same problem, you know, getting X number of IOPS uh, for virtualization by any other means. This will be much more operationally efficient than solving the same problem any other, other way. So, you know, these things are very obvious. And, you know, we are doing this all 
in a in a seamless enough way that we are going to afford this solution to anyone who wants to use it instead of saying that well you know this solution is only for people who are willing to throw away their current storage system or who are willing to throw away their current infrastructure this is for everyone you can move to new infrastructure you can be on old infrastructure this is relevant that was that was tactical this is what excites me is you know come 2014 or the next half of 2013 for that matter, depending on how, how big our beta program gets, people will realize that what Pernix Data has actually achieved is it has created a brand new data tier, a data tier that resides much closer to applications, and it takes care of your data in motion problems, which is performance and scale. And that is totally different from your capacity data tier, which is extremely good at providing capacity and it takes care of your data services problem, things like snapshotting and replication and cloning and so on. And this is how you, first of all, <clears throat> make the storage problem orthogonal, is you, know, you design one way for capacity, another way for IOPS. And you can now you know, design along these two axes in a totally orthogonal manner. You can scale them in a very orthogonal manner. You can also make choices in a very orthogonal manner. Your choice of scale out doesn't limit you from your choice of your favorite storage vendor for capacity. And that choice is really based on the, the quality of data services they provide, not on the quality of IOPS they provide. Again, tactical slide before we go into the demo. Uh, as of right now, we are doing betas, and uh, we welcome people to sign up. Uh, as of right now, uh, this thing runs on all versions of vSphere 5.0 and 5.1. We use VMware APIs uh, that, are, that are in these releases. So any patch update, any, any version of these, these product lines will do. And we hope to actually make it run on whatever VMware releases this year. Any storage system? VMware is releasing something this year? I hope so. <laughs> uh, that's been the precedent. So. But I'm not making any promises. This is why, you know, if there's a vSphere 2013, well, you know. And if they call it vSphere 2013, it didn't come from you, right? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> any block storage system on the VMware HCL is supported today. Uh, we are going to expand that HCL. Any flash device, PCI or SSD, on the VMware HCL is supported today. Some of our beta customers, uh, users, I should say, uh, and uh, someone probably Marco knows is uh, they throw in USB micro SD cards with Pernix data and absolutely <laughs> highly unrecommended. You know, the fact that it gets 18,000 IOPS doesn't mean that you should do it. But anyway, you know. I expect that should have a lifetime in about a week and a half. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, point being, you know, people are in the discovery phase of what they can do. Uh, you know, there's some people who throw in the most randomest of flash devices into, into their vSphere installs and just see Pernix data rock the boat. There are some people who think about it in a more architectural sense, is that, well, you know, if I'm going to get most of my IOPS here, how, what does that mean to my storage purchasing decisions? Do I still stay on iSCSI because it just elongated my iSCSI life? Do I, uh, do I now increase the spindle to flash ratio in my storage system because most of the IOPS is coming from here and not there, and so on and so forth. And those are the more exciting conversations. So if I choose a PCI uh, flash card, do I need to use the same card in all ESX hosts? Uh, good point. Uh, you don't need to use the same hardware in all hosts. In fact, the demos are going to use different hardware because we as a company can only afford a small <laughs> amount of PCI <laughs> cards. <laughs> right. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So not the same type and uh, the same capacity then? <coughs> it could be different types, it could be different capacities. Uh, it doesn't matter. Really flexible. Yeah. So the obvious question is how, do, how does the right cache get flushed when I want to take a storage system snapshot? Oh, uh, good point. Um, when you are running in write back, uh, there's two ways of looking at it. One is uh, which is you know what I would recommend people do is you switch the virtual machine on the fly from write back mode to write through for the duration of that snapshot operation. So you switch the policy to write through, take the snapshot, and 
put it back in write back. This is all done on the fly. You can add, you can accelerate virtual machines that are already running. You can, well, I guess we'll go into a demo. But, uh, and you can change policies on the fly. So that's one, one way to do it. The other way to think about it is it is adding latency to when your data will actually go to the storage system. So let's say, you know, it's a 40 second latency. I'm just making up numbers, 40 second latency, one, one, one minute latency. And so that is, how much you are, your snapshot is off by. If you, if you don't well, get to switch the difference between switch an application your... consistent snapshot and a crash consistent snapshot. Oh yeah. It's not a time issue, it's a consistency issue. Uh, well, yes and no. So now we are going to uh, a little more detail. So you can actually run write back mode in, in a way where we are actually doing delayed writes that are crash consistent. And then you can run it in a way that you're doing delayed writes that are not crash consistent. In that case, you, you care to quiesce your application. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> no. I, if, if you're caching rights, mm -hmm. and I want to get an application consistent snapshot, mm -hmm. then you know, clearly because it's VMware world, I'm going to have one and only one VM in that data store, and I'm going to trigger a VSS snapshot, mm -hmm. or I'm going to run a script on my Linux machine that's going to say, make the data consistent. All right. <coughs> oh yeah, right. So at, at that point, point well taken. Sure. You need so, to flush that data to that exact yeah. point in time. Sure. And then let the storage system take the snapshot. Yeah, point well taken. So then, let's just say the recommendation is the best way out is you switch it to write through, which can be done as a VSS provider or separately, and that gets you your thing. So it's flushed. So do you have a chained VSS provider for that? We don't. We don't. Okay, so I'm going to have to script it. Yeah. Shall I count on you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the check. We'd like to see by the Okay. Yes. Uh, well, as, as, I haven't seen the API yet, but you know, if it if it's for a backup, it's relatively simple to, to put a script in the before backup that puts it into write back mode, and right. then has a one minute delay to let it flush. Right. And then go through the normal VSS thing, and then in the after backup, put it, the two commands in to say, go back to write back mode. All right, right. <coughs> yeah, so I'm digressing, but just, you know, along the vein of what you were just saying, um, as of 1.0, the product will support uh, PowerShell-based uh, uh, command set, so, you know, people can maybe use that to get their stuff done. So that's, that's fine for John, but, you know, the Linux guys are going to be pissed. Okay. Oh, actually, it turns out most vSphere administrator are, uh, um, yeah. administrators are huge PowerShell fans. I bet there's a tweet coming in uh, about, you know. That's another understatement. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So.